uh, uh, we thank you for your time uh, being uh, you know uh, able to be with us. Now, if I can just uh, just a short bio data. Uh, Yamak Bormat uh, entered politics in 1977. I think in your uh, career as a politician, uh, uh, you won the Satu seat in 1981. You were also, uh, I think, uh, later in 1987, made uh, the Minister of Industrial Development. Uh, and uh, you were also appointed as Minister of Tourism, Minister of Housing and Urbanization, uh, as well as the Deputy Chief Minister in 2016. Uh, Yamak Bormat uh, is also the Pro Chancellor of Swinburne University of Technology, Sarawak Campus. And you are also currently here. Uh, the uh, uh, Sabakas President, uh, which stands for Pertubuhan Belia Kebangsaan Bersatu Sarawak, uh, since uh, 2009. I hope I got information right. <laughs> uh. Ya, yeah, Pak Bormat. Yeah. Uh. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, if I may share something which is very sentimental to MPC. When we mention uh, about Dato Abang Johari, something very uh, sentimental. Now, your tenure when you were the MID Minister, you were instrumental uh, in ensuring MPC. Uh, we got okay. a piece of land. Uh, we were given a piece of land to set up our office in the Mat Laut. And I yeah. remember uh, the uh, complex was officiated in June. Uh, in June yeah. 2007, uh, which is exactly, uh, sorry, uh, June 2000, uh, which is exactly yeah. today, the month of June, the year 2020. Yeah. We have been Sarawak officially with our campus there for 20 years. So, yeah. on behalf of everyone in MPC, uh, Dato' Patinggi, we would like to offer our utmost appreciation on your significant role and your foresight uh, in getting MPC to serve uh, the people as well as both the public and also the private sectors uh, in yeah. Sarawak to further enhance productivity you know, of the economy uh, in the state. Now, sir, if I may uh, bring you know everyone to yeah. the uh, webinar, uh, session today, which is uh, post COVID 19, uh, Sarawak, the new normal. Now, uh, just to give some background, this COVID 19 will be remembered as the virus that stopped the world, right? Uh, in short, uh. now, yes. uh, according to WHO, since the outbreak was first identified, now this uh, COVID 19 uh, has spread to more than 200 over countries and it has demonstrated a noticeable impact on global economic growth. Now, this uh, pandemic has uh, come uh, as a shock to the society at large, the health system and so economies, including governments uh, worldwide. Now, the government today plays a major role uh, during this current pandemic that all of us are facing. And uh, we must consider seriously the trade-off while uh, we are giving a lot of priority uh, to uh, safety and health of citizens, but we want to make sure that you know the economy is still growing. Yeah? Because mm -hmm. social restriction causes businesses to shut down, supply chains being disrupted, and this may lead to possible layoff and also income uh, shock uh, to uh, all citizens. Now, the significant impact, uh, Yamak Borma, if you agree with me, I think we, we do have some vulnerable industries, especially like tourism. Tourism will be the first to be impacted. And tourism is also said to be the last, you know, that will be coming out. Right? It will take, you know, longer, you know, to recover. Now, we also have the manufacturing, hospitality, travel. Huh? And all this carries a domino effect on the SMEs. And we know that SMEs, you know, made up 98% of all business establishments. Now, while we agree that we may need, uh, we need to manage huh, the health crisis, huh? and give it utmost priority, no social economic consequences need to be looked into. So that is why uh, I think, uh, 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 I think uh, we are very fortunate uh, to have, uh, you know, the frontliners who have contributed a lot and we could see that, you know, we're able to flatten the uh, infection curve. And that's why yeah. I think the government also uh, yeah. announced that, you know, we can open up more of the economic sectors. Now, just before I begin, you know, with my, First uh, question, Yamak Bormat. If I may share yeah. uh, with yourself and also the audience here, the Malaysian Institute of Economic Research, uh, MIER, in short, uh, now uh, uh, there is a study being done uh, using the worst case scenario uh, for Malaysia, real gross domestic product uh, GDP for 2020 is forecasted to contract by 6.9%. That shows the impact uh, uh, coming from this pandemic. 
and we are also expecting a total of around 2 million uh, uh, labor labor force uh, will be displaced and private consumption is expected to fall by 11% due to income losses so because companies have to close down you know uh, you know some need to be laid off uh, this you know uh, will have impact also on uh, income you know of of you know workers in Malaysia and that would definitely uh, will have impact uh, on uh, private consumption in the country but however on a positive note the government had announced three economic stimulus packages totaling 280 million eh? a billion sorry eh? to improve the economic risk eh? arising from this pandemic and we hope that these packages eh? which are expected to assist the rakyat smes and all economic sectors to climb out of this quandary and just recently the prime minister had also announced the plan jana semula economy negara in short uh, penjana another 35 million were announced eh, to assist uh, and also address issues of unemployment uh, uh, also to uh, you know bring back the tourism sector uh, you know into uh, into uh, you know what it was uh, before the pandemic and also assisting the SMEs. so dato patindi uh, covid-19 has a profound impact on the working world as well as the people's uh, mental and physical well-being now some of the new normal includes temperature checks health screenings and crop control measures and uh, we are also aware even uh, when we go to the government uh, premises private and public sectors as well as individuals uh, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, there have been a lot of extraordinary measures also uh, being put into place now if we uh, may bring up uh, uh, you know all this scenario into the context of Sarawak uh, what does the new normal look like uh, after COVID-19 uh, especially in the state of Sarawak and what is the state government's preparation for post-COVID-19 era? Uh, to you, sir, uh, we would like to listen from you. What are your thoughts sir, on the new world <coughs> in Sarawak and what are the state government's preparation on this? Please, Yamak Bohumat. Yeah, first of all, I would like to express uh, my appreciation uh, to NPC for inviting me to participate in this uh, sort of forum and uh, it is very pertinent that uh, we have to face uh, this pandemic uh, 19 uh, with a view of how to solve uh, the impact of pandemic 19 COVID 19 to the economy as well as to the people at large some say that this uh, pandemic will bring about negative impact on our economic development and some of course say that it is worse than the depression of 1930 and therefore uh, as far as uh, Sarawak is concerned uh, we have to accept the fact that uh, we have to change including our way of life as well as what they call the new normal life the new norm and uh, with that background, uh, Sarawak has to have a relook on how to uh, in, uh, how to really bring about recovery to our sectors that have been affected by COVID-19. As you know. Uh, the industry that has really been affected is tourism and number two is of course our manufacturing sector as well as our services sector because of the MCO no activities are being done for the past uh, three months and that deprive uh, us of uh, our economic activities that give uh, life to uh, the citizen Against that background, uh, what Sarawak has done is we will we have uh, supplemented the stimulus packages by the federal government, and the state has uh, actually under our BKSS Bantuan uh, Sarawak Kusayang, uh, we have injected uh, about 2.3 billion ringgit 
to complement the packages that have been announced by the federal government. And that will, you know, create certain uh, buffer to the people that are affected by this uh, pandemic COVID-19, particularly the those who are self-employed. Number two is the SMEs. And number three is, of course, uh, we have to assist in healthcare services. Uh, this is what we have done. And uh, now we are entering what we call a recovery stage, uh, as announced by the Prime Minister. And Sarawak is uh, actually uh, preparing itself uh, for the short term uh, approach as well as the long term approach. Uh, in order to tackle the economic problems uh, as a result of this uh, COVID-19. Talking about uh, the short-term approach, uh, the past three months or so, uh, we have stopped all our economic activities. And Sarawak has actually, in our budget, we want to implement all our infrastructure projects that have been approved by the government actually is in the means of implementation, particularly the construction of our roads and bridges. Number two is our utility supply, that is power as well as uh, water. And number three is our, what we call rural transformation projects. And these are the projects that have been agreed to and in the midst of implementation. When the COVID-19 uh, happened last three months, we stopped all this project. Therefore, the short term, what we do, starting from uh, when we open up our economy by stages, we continue with the implementation of this project, including the Lebuh Raya Borneo. The infrastructure mm -hmm. project totaling about roughly about over nearly 30 billion. And this is uh, the project that we will continue uh, immediately when the government say you can proceed uh, our economic activities. In other words, that will spur and stimulate our economy immediately. Actually, uh, tomorrow I will be going to Korean district uh, to officiate the uh, one bridge that we're going to build in uh, crossing the Korean River as part of our coastal uh, road construction. And uh, with that, this project's implementation, the impact on our economy will be positive. This is our short term. And uh, this uh, project implementation will come up to the year 2021-22. For the long term project, as a result of uh, this pandemic COVID-19, we have to have a relook at our projects for the future. Sarawak has a long-term uh, policy where we hope to be a developed state by the year 2030. And that is our long-term uh, uh, objective. And uh, what we're going to do now is I have set up what we call the Sarawak Economic Action uh, Council, where we have the academics, the professional, as well as the private sector and the public sector to look into the direction what we should do uh, as a long-term measure for our economic uh, development. And there are 10 sectors to be looked into and there are sub-committee where they will deliberate on the direction of our economy because uh, we feel that after this COVID-19, the original plan in our 12th national plan is no longer relevant. That is what we call uh, a new norm. In other words, uh, it's also a new economic approach that we have uh, to undertake, undertake uh, for the long-term interest of Sarawak as well as the country at large. Basically, 
the core is based on digitalization that is digital economy and sustainability environmental sustainability that is the core and then that will definitely uh, influence the 10 sectors that i have uh, identified one is our data center and innovation number two is our education and human capital development number three is renewable energy number four is our basic infrastructure development that is a continuation of what we have uh, actually uh, planned in our program number five is commercial agriculture where we would like the private sector to come in in our development of agriculture and this agriculture is meant for not only food security but also for export because as you know we have advantage on land as well as on, on energy number six is uh, manufacturing especially sme and entrepreneurship number seven is the mining sector this include uh, oil and gas as well as uh, gas based uh, industry particularly petrochemical and number eight is forestry number nine tourism and of course uh, the tenth sector is services services uh, includes uh, our social uh, uh, projects for instance, uh, this pandemic, we know very well that social distancing is important, meaning uh, you have to have a look at our housing de design, particularly the housing for the low income group, to make sure that uh, you have sort of a safety net when you uh, develop or design a new house. At the moment, I think uh, we can see uh, the impact of this COVID-19 because space is important and therefore we have to look into our social amenities for the people. Uh, that is our long-term uh, uh, policy and Sarawak uh, at the moment I have uh, a committee to look into this and I have give, given them a uh, date uh, timeline by September. Uh, they put up their recommendation to us for the government to consider and that will be our focus in the 12 measure plan. Thank you, Yamak Bormat. Uh, you know, very uh, uh, detailed explanation uh, on what are the measures, you know, undertaken by the government. Uh. You had also uh, mentioned about the 10, you know, areas that you are looking into to really, uh, you know, address issues of this pandemic and bringing, you know, Sarawak out. Uh. Uh, for this post COVID 19. Eh? Now, uh, Yama Bormat, now you have put it rightly, uh, you know, uh, in, you mentioned that, you know, uh, this uh, kind of pandemic, of course, you know, it comes with, with a lot of this, you know, negative impact. But uh, at times, crisis would also come with some blessings, all right? And uh, yeah. you mentioned about the state, uh, which is moving into, uh, you know, digitalization, uh, moving towards digital economy. So I'm sure with this pandemic, uh, you know, it really create uh, the urgency and really ramp up uh, the uh, initiative moving towards that. Now, you know, within these extraordinary uh, challenges uh, that everyone is facing, even within the context of, you know, Sarawak itself, you know, uh, issues of uncertainty, uh, leaders are also, I think, uh, you know, under pressure, you know, to make decision. And we mentioned about the trade off uh, between, you know, citizens, you know, health and safety and also, uh, economic survival. Now, of course, decision by the leaders would definitely uh, shape the state, you know, for years to come, right? Whatever decision that we make and whatever policy that is going to be, uh, you know, expedited, you know, on ground, that will shape, you know, uh, the state, you know, for years to come. Now, as I had uh, mentioned, in every crisis, we bound to have uh, opportunities that we can, you know, we can siege. And at the same yeah. time, there are also blessings, uh, uh, if we look at it, you know, positively. Now, my question to you, sir, what might uh, uh, the silver linings of the crisis be uh, uh, in the context of Sarawak, right? In every uh, crisis, you want to see some silver lining, you know, uh, you know, in that. And how can leaders, uh, especially in Sarawak, use this very moment to build a more prosperous 
equitable and sustainable development. Uh, environment, as you had mentioned, uh, sustainability and also environmental is one aspect that the state government is giving you know emphasis on. Now, how will Sarawak change uh, towards ensuring that post COVID nineteen is sustainable and inclusive, right? So, what will be the civil lining uh, within the situation we are in, and how can leaders you know uh, uh, build you know this uh, the momentum uh, towards a more prosperous, equitable, and sustainable environment? And how was Rawa as a state, you know, change towards ensuring that post COVID nineteen is sustainable and also inclusive? Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, that uh, we are entering into a new way of life, as well as economic uh, landscape after COVID nineteen. We know very well that uh, the next uh, ten to fifteen years. I think the key is uh, more on uh, digitalization. We are very lucky that uh, we started uh, the awareness of digitalization three years ago, when we had our what we call IDEX conference, uh, where we invited international experts on this. So, in other words, the culture of dig digitalization has been there three years ago. And now uh, some are quite skeptical before, but now they realize the importance of technology. For instance, uh, fishermen also now selling their uh, what they call ikan through online, and then they order everything on online now. So that has really changed uh, the mode of transaction. Uh, no longer physical contact, but rather based on online e-commerce. So in other words, the Sarawakians are now uh, gradually uh, getting aware on the importance of technology. And the Sarawak government, as you know, we have set up our Sarawak Multimedia Authority, SMA, and we are complimenting, complimenting the federal government putting up our basic uh, digital infrastructure. Even now, we are looking into how to implement 5G. As you know, uh, Sarawak is a very large state and we have to spend uh, quite a substantial fund uh, to put up our infrastructure development, which is now being currently done. Uh, by the state authorities, to, together, of course, uh, together with the M, M, uh, Multimedia Corporation, a federal government agency. So this is one area uh, that will change uh, our lifestyle, meaning the new norm. Number two is the importance of uh, environment. Very, very important environment. Because uh, you know, this COVID-19, whatever you say, is something to do with healthcare. So healthcare also has to be connected with uh, your, you know, your how you live. So these are all interconnected. For us in Sarawak, we are very fortunate. Uh, we are blessed with all these resources. So what we do is we want to enhance uh, our environment uh, by using uh, latest technology. At the same time, we want to transform our uh, various economic activities, including agriculture, using, uh, for instance, IoT and certain other technologies in order to increase productivity, increase uh, production, and then uh, you can become the supplier of this important uh, food uh, uh, security. So this uh, is an example uh, what we are going to do. And as I mentioned earlier just now, it has to be inclusive. You know, there must be a connectivity between urban and rural. Urban is where you have this financial uh, sort of uh, facilities available uh, using blockchain, even blockchain technology later. And then uh, what is important is there must be a connectivity between urban and rural. And rural, you have to transform as a source uh, of uh, all this product. 
uh, using uh, technology. So this is what uh, we are going to do for the next uh, five to ten years. And uh, as you know, Sarawak is export oriented uh, economy. We have to sell our products uh, to the market. Uh, at the moment, uh, I can share with you that our Singapore office, our trade office in Singapore, they got a lot of queries uh, because they want uh, to make sure that uh, enough uh, food uh, in Singapore as well as from Singapore distributed to other areas. So our office in Singapore, it was fortunate that we set up the office last year and that become our contact point in Singapore. And uh, with that sort of uh, contact, marketing, uh, new marketing mode or new norm, and at the same time, uh, the interaction between the exporters and the importers, I'm sure that uh, the new business environment will be conducive for us to grow our economy based on our strength. As you know, Sarawak strength is our energy. Uh, we have our renewable energy. And number two, number two is I think our Sarawakians are trainable. Uh, you know, we can train them. And number three is, uh, of course, uh, we have to upgrade our logistics. Uh, I'm talking about even cargo, uh, air cargo has to be enhanced. And then uh, with that sort of uh, connectivity, uh, together with uh, uh, what we call digital connectivity, e-commerce, as well as uh, production using technology, uh, I think this is part and parcel of that inclusivity that we have to get people engaged together and then they will be able uh, to play their part uh, after COVID-19. But what is important is in infrastructure. That is why the state government spent billions to upgrade our infrastructure, including the coastal road. As you know, Sarawak is very vast, a lot of sungai kita terpaksa lah bangunkan banyak jabatan dan jabatan ni jabatan yang besar-besar uh, last time uh, you know we have all this uh, sort of uh, uh, infrastructure that is needed a lot of fun but we have uh, what we call a new uh, engineering uh, financial engineering for us to uh, fund uh, the cost of this basic infrastructure when the infrastructure is in place, including water supply as well as energy in the rural areas, then the economy will start churning its path. Ya, Mak Bormat, I agree with you. Sarawak is a blessed country. It's not just yeah. about your renewable energy. I think the environment there. You know, you've got a lot yeah. of this posh okay. green, you know, scenery and all that. You know, the country is still naturally remain intact. The beauty yeah. is there. I can tell you yeah. a lot of people, they look forward even to retire in Sarawak. <laughs> I was there for <laughs> five years. I, I've traveled a lot. Welcome, welcome. I've traveled really long. And uh, it's just that sometimes we don't we don't really, you know, set, you know, where we wanted to go. We just sit in our car, we just drive all the way to Cebu and we just yeah. check in and then it's just that the environment is something that, you know, uh, people really appreciate. And it is yeah, always okay. a break for me when I go down to Sarawak, you know, uh, yeah. even though on official duty, but I take it as a break because the environment there is something that you don't get here in Kuala Lumpur. Oh, thank, right, you. thank you very much, sir, for, for, uh, for the explanation. Uh, we all agree that uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, this pandemic has also exposed uh, the quality of governance, you know, of institution. Yeah. Governments yeah. and all that, sir. If I, if you may allow me, I would like to move into the public sector, you know, uh, organization, public sector service. Now we know that with this pandemic, uh, uh, most of our citizens, that the rakyat, you know, will turn uh, to the government, you know, for assistance and also protection, right? And of course, uh, if you know leaders and also civil servants fail to deliver uh, requirements of the rakyat, you know, they quickly lose, you know, credibility and legitimacy. Now, uh, could you share with us, you know, how can civil servants in Sarawak, right? And uh, uh, civil service, you know, civil service in this state has all been benchmarked by others. Yeah. I know because I've been doing a lot of benchmarking programs. Huh? Your land management is one of the best 
right? Your your uh, even your civil service itself, even to the extent uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, management of your Sharia cases, the other states are you know they, they benchmark Sarawak. Now coming back to the civil service, uh, how can civil servants uh, in Sarawak be more productive and improve their service delivery, especially after COVID nineteen? What is it more they can do now? They are you know efficient. What is it that they can be more productive and be more efficient? Uh, would you mind you know sharing with us you know your thoughts on this, sir? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know what I did uh, when uh, I was given uh, no no when I lead the the state government, I want the civil service to know technology. Technology is the key now. So what happened is there is a, a, a committee that look into our digital development agenda, which include the civil service and uh, the connectivity. As you know, in Sarawak, we have our state, uh, you know, uh, up there. Then we have Bahagian, the divisional uh, administration. You have the district uh, administration. And these people should be connected through technology. And then they can exchange uh, their information. And assuming they got problems on the spot, then they can definitely uh, bring it up to the senior officers so that the senior officers can look into it and then find solution. That is why, for instance, our land and survey department we have uh, their own uh, development of uh, their application to make sure that uh, all the land issues are settled within two days. Even the title of land should be issued, if possible, one day through what they call their own uh, software that has been developed. The other one is now JKR is doing the same thing. They call it JKR Dash. And this app will be able people, including the senior officers, as well as the ministers like myself, to look into the stage of implementation of project that has been approved. And this can be done uh, within uh, one week. You know the actual situation and we can solve the problem down there. And these are very important for the civil servant to know the mode of monitoring projects. And also the question of, uh, you know, giving training to these people. The state government is, uh, you know, have that uh, training program. For the senior civil servant, we send them to re-equip with modern knowledge either through Harvard, we, there is a Harvard program, management program, and also other institution for them to get exposed to the new mode of managing uh, uh, government. We call it good governance. Uh, these are the areas where we send our civil servants uh, to get them exposed uh, to the modern mode of uh, managing uh, the government, as well as the importance of uh, innovation uh, among them. And even I want my ministers also to be trained on that line so that uh, there is uh, these people are complementing each other, the civil servant, the public sector, as well as the private sector. They know their language and they know how to engage among themselves. Otherwise, there will be mismatch uh, between the public sector and the private sector. Normally, the private sector are well exposed. But if the public sector is not exposed, there will be mismatch between the two. So that will definitely create some problem that you have to solve. Uh, so this is the, the way how we want to get the public service together with the private uh, sector. Thank you, sir. Pardon me for not introducing myself earlier. Uh, I'm Latif from NPC, especially for the uh, participants who are joining us online. 
we would like to invite them. I'm sure they have questions that they, they may want to post, uh, you know, to the chief minister. Uh, they can do so, uh, post their questions into our chat box. I think the coordinator will assist us uh, with the questions yeah. later to uh, to be uh, brought over to uh, the chief minister to respond. Now, sir, you have just responded on the uh, public service, uh, the civil servants, uh, you know, role and all that. Now, uh, let me bring you now with the industry now. I'm bringing you back, uh, you know, to the industries because these are the affected, uh, you know, uh, I would say, uh, you know, section of society. Yeah? Now, a report, uh, uh, there was uh, a special edition report, you know, done by World Economic Forum, uh, uh, Global Risk Report, they call it, examined the views of nearly 350 senior risk professionals. Uh, and uh, they were asked to assess 31 risks within three categories. One, what are those most likely yeah, for the world? Two, most concerning for the world. One is most likely that will impact the world. The second is most concerning to them. And third, what is the most worrisome you know, for companies? Now, two thirds of the respondents uh, identified that a prolonged global recession as their top concern. So if you were to uh, you know, prolong you know, the situation they're in, you may lead to recession. So this is their concern. And half of these uh, respondents identified bankruptcies, and industry consolidation, failure of industries to recover, and also disruption of supply chain as you know their crucial worries. Right now, according to fifty percent of the respondents, too, the third most worrisome aspect for companies is increase in cyber attack. Now you mentioned about uh, going digital. This is you know one of the worries that they have. And of course, uh, uh, data fraud is also one you know, concern that they have, as well as the breakdown of IT infrastructure and also networks. So these are some of those you know, top concerns uh, uh, to many of the respondents. Now, we are talking about industry here, we're talking about companies, we are moving from public sector uh, that we discussed earlier. In your, yeah, opinion, yeah. Yeah, in your opinion, what can industries or companies uh, at firm level do to accelerate uh, the economy in Sarawak and what are the ways entrepreneurs and SMEs can be resilient uh, especially under the present situation? Well, uh, it's a very difficult question but I'm sure the private sector also has to adjust themselves to the new norm. The way they run their business the way uh, they really manage uh, uh, all the uh, uh, the other sectors in the economy, they have to change. For Sarawak, we are quite blessed because we are resource-based economy. Meaning, uh, what we do, we just accelerate on our process of production. And number three is, of course, uh, the private sector must identify the market opportunities. And these are the key uh, areas they have to look into. Because at the end of the day, it is the, the market that determines their survival. And therefore, they have to analyze uh, what are the potential in the market. At the moment, one area that I... I'm very confident has a very bright future is agriculture, food security. And uh, in terms of pricing, this uh, food must be reasonable and affordable to be consumed by the market. And I think for Srava, that's why we want to emphasize on commercial agriculture. Uh, this, uh, I think, uh, the market is quite large. For Sarawak, as you know, we are in the, this part of the world where the bulk of the population is within six hours flight. Uh, over three billion people, China, India, East Asia, is only within about six, uh, six hours flight. And uh, if uh, we have the opportunity uh, to produce uh, products that are demanded or goods demanded by the market, the potential is there. In Sarawak, uh, we are having a very small population, only 2.8 million, uh, with 134,000 square kilometers. 
And that's why I was talking about sustainability of environment. As you know, in energy sector, the world wants uh, renewable energy that is clean. And uh, for us in Sarawak, we have to look into our forestry sector because plant can be replanted. So I am going to talk uh, to the expert how we can accelerate the production of uh, what we call raw material that is based on our trees that can become a source of renewable energy. Uh, I understand that some countries, they want to change nuclear to renewable energy. And they have uh, what they call discovered wood charcoal, meaning you have this pallet of wood that can turn into charcoal to produce energy. And for that, I think we can plant our trees here with that vast area to produce this new product meant for energy. Number two, as you know, Sarawak is now experimenting on hydrogen where you use the process of uh, electrolysis to convert uh, hydrogen from our water resource into uh, hydrogen and hydrogen economy is fast expanding now. Actually, in Sarawak, we have bought the four Hyundai vehicle as a test experiment using uh, hydrogen as another form of energy. Meaning, renewable energy is there. We got the resources. The only thing is, uh, we just develop scientifically. So, meaning, what I'm saying here is this, that the private sector uh, must be able to analyze the potential and then they can uh, play their part in the changing world because uh, throughout the world we need clean energy though one is uh, food sector food security number two is renewable energy and that is why uh, we have to have a relook at our 12 nature plan where sustainability environmental sustainability is the key and uh, talking about this it also help on our health care because uh, our uh, what are called biodiversity resources we need a lot of scientists to look into the possibility of perhaps producing a new vaccine uh, we do not know what are the new disease again <laughs> after this uh, COVID-19 we do not know because environment is the key uh, once uh, you are living in a very clean environment that is already a security for you to get out of this uh, you know this new diseases uh, in the world yeah thank you very much uh, very inter interesting explanation that you are sharing with us now, uh, uh, we realize that, you know, with this pandemic uh, and uh, uh, restricted movement is also, you know, put into force. Now, we see that a lot of, you know, uh, families are being, you know, confined, you know, within their own, you know, homes. Now, we could also see that data consumption uh, is also on the rise because people are now using a lot of this digital uh, technology they are using, uh, online, you know, uh, facilities and all that. Now, for example, like isolated families in their home now, uh, they are using, you know, video services such as the WhatsApp, Skype, huh? and business meetings, like what we are doing now, sir, uh, uh, you know, we have moved into, uh, you know, utilization of these uh, systems such as Zoom, GoToMeeting, Webinar, and also other digital uh, platforms. And this actually leads uh, to new business and employment opportunities. And that's why we could see that, you know, while there are some other, you know, what, what other sectors, uh, you know, uh, experiencing, you know, uh, impact where they have to slow down their operation, some, you know, leads, you know, to closure of their operation. But new businesses start picking up, like food delivery. Uh, you can see that, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, 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 usage of this kind of system. Now you see even companies are not having uh, meetings, uh, uh, using online system without having physical presence. They don't have to go to the office. Now, we, even within the context of MPC, so we propagate the concept of what we call productive from anywhere meaning to say uh many are uh using the concept of working you know from home you don't have to go to the office 
Uh, we in NPC, we propagate what we call working from anywhere. Doesn't matter where you are, but as long as you deliver, all right? You need to have the mechanism, you have your KPI, and then we have what we call weekly meeting using this technology. Now, within the context of Sarawak, sir, because of this uh, so-called, you know, uh, restricted movement, people are still adhe adhering to this social distancing because the virus is still there. It is going to be there forever. Yeah? Unless, you know, we come up with some vaccine, you know, or, you know, uh, you know some measures that we're able to uh, get rid of this, you know, uh, pandemic. Yeah? Now, as I had mentioned, what is your take, sir, when we talk about this technology now, which more and more people are now uh, investing into, including companies. Now, if you look at within the public service, uh, will there be a scenario whereby you will allow, you know, employees to work from where they are, as long as they get, you know, connected to the internet, they have got all the gadgets and equipment, and as far as, you know, their supervisors are concerned, they deliver. So what is your thought, sir? Because you mentioned about digital. Digital is actually really moving into online, all right? Using uh, what we call this online technology. So your take, sir, on on uh, you know on the uh, on, on the scenario that uh, I have just brought up. What are your thoughts, sir? Please. Yeah, thank you. You know, there has been a lot of debates about digitalization because you will change uh, the way you work and that we create unemployment uh, to certain sector. A lot of debates on this. But I believe that there must be a solution to this because technology will create new jobs. When you create a new job, then you have to be trained for the new job. Then the old job is no longer applicable or relevant. That will be redundant. And therefore, your training uh, has to be there in order for them to get uh, familiarized with uh, technology. I remember uh, I read of uh, one, you know, debate on the uh, Industrial Revolution uh, before the, the, uh, the invention of steam engine. Before that, there was a transportation using horses and you have somebody in front of the horse, eh, behind the horse for the carriage of the horse to, to transport goods and services. But then when train come in, that job is replaced by the train driver, meaning it's no longer a man you know, no, behind the horse getting the horse to run. So this is a new job, the, the same with technology. So when you talk about cyber security, meaning you have to have a cyber engineers, a new profession altogether, that look into cyber security. Uh, how are you going to really protect uh, information that uh, travel from one spot to another spot? I was in US the other day and uh, you know what this one company in Silicon Valley is still experimenting how to protect information using fiber optic, even cloud. Now they want to protect information that uh, travel from one area to another area or one spot to another spot through cloud, clouding. Fiber optic, of course, uh, there is an element of protection, but not cloud. So this is, uh, I think, uh, new research, a new way of life, a new job that will be created. The other one is, of course, your data analyst. You have to have a new job that really analyze all data. And uh, meaning, what I'm saying is, when you go to a new era, there will be a new job available in the new era. And we have to train our people towards a new era. So because your economic landscape has changed. You know, mobile payment. 15 years ago, we didn't have mobile payment. So you rely on your credit card or checks or credit card. But today, you just have your phone and then go through your QR code and you got the payment there. And that means the banking 
banking industry has to change from the normal conventional banking to a new norm, a new way for you to make your payment. And these are uh, technologies that will create new jobs. That's why I am not very worried about job displacement because of technology, because you will create new job because of technology. So your engineers also change. Now you are talking about 3D printing. 3D printing now may be quite expensive, but in 10 years time, the process of 3D printing, I think will come down. So what you do is you will produce product using technology like, like the 3D printer and that will produce new product at a cheaper rate. So what I'm saying here is this, your economic landscape will change, then you have the new norm of how you do your job, how you produce your product. And number three, you can analyze your market through what we call data analysis. That is why now you have to go through data center where some say the new oil is data, big data. <laughs> that is the new oil uh, for the future. So for Sarawak, for that matter, Malaysia, if you want to be in that game, whether you like or not, you have to get ourselves prepared in the game and you must have that prerequisite to know technology and to know uh, the potential of technology in the new economic era where physical contact is not there. For instance, today we don't have physical contact. It's just through your laptop and also uh, through this uh, sort of interaction between you and me. So this is the way uh, we have to do job in the future. Yeah. Agree, Ahmad yeah, Bormat, uh, you know, from physical face to face, but now we have what we call face to face screen, a yeah. kind <laughs> of you know, engagement, all right? right, right. And uh, I've also put rightly earlier, you mentioned uh, about the role of the private sector. I think the private sector will have to work closely with the government, right? Yeah. Even when we talk yeah. about this, you know, digitalization, uh, 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 of course, government will facilitate, you know, with all the, uh, uh, you know, internet connection facility, the infrastructure, the broadband and all that. But of course, uh, companies which are operating under that environment, uh, as you had also put it rightly, yeah, now, uh, the, uh, the economy, economic landscape, you know, is changing uh, due to this, you know, pandemic. But of course, while there will be some, you know, traditional businesses, you know, which, which may be uh, phased out, but there'll be new businesses coming into. It's just like what we have seen today, uh, you know, cases like, uh, uh, you know, farm fresh, uh, there is a company uh, which produces, you know, farm fresh milk. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, they were able to sell only about 300 bottles a day. But because of the uh, social, uh, uh, you know, uh, distancing, yeah. uh, uh, you know, restricted movement and all that, so they went on technology. They they went through e-commerce. They do e-marketing. They use their website, their you know their portal, and all that. And so they are able to sell ten thousand bottles a day now. Ten thousand okay. bottles. And there is a company called uh, I think electrical company. Within this uh, pandemic, uh, uh, they they have they have actually uh, shut down their outlet where we used to go, you know, to their outlet to buy. But now yeah, they go yeah. online. And they can generate, you know, a sales of 93 million. So as you put yeah. it rightly, sir, yes, I think we have to be creative. You know, we have to do a lot of thinking while we do accept that this pandemic is creating a lot of problem, but there are also opportunities and also blessings being created. Yeah. And you could see that uh, people talk about digitalization. Uh, I used to joke also with some, uh, you know, yeah. some of them I say, sometimes you need to have this kind of pandemic, COVID-19, to really ramp up, you know, <laughs> digitalization. All right, sir. Uh, uh, we we have uh, already, uh, you know, uh, come to almost you know 10 a.m. I'm not sure, Azro. Is there any question that we are getting from our online participants, Azro? Yeah, uh, we have uh, several questions here, uh, yeah. but maybe you can just continue first, or we want to uh, ask the question first. I think we can ask the question because uh, later uh, we will have this. Uh, 
launching of Sarawak Productive. Mm -hmm. So I think let's take the question first because once the launching is over, I think the program will also end. So let's go into the question first. What are the questions that we have received, you know, from our online participants? Okay, so um, one of the question from Jason Han. Eh? Uh, so they focus the other day, Tanya, onto uh, Minister. Uh, uh, Sarawak eh, for the long term plan setting up the Sarawak Economic Action Council is a great step to deliberate on double actions toward our goal for a clean healthy and resilient environment for the current and future generation so the question was may I ask what is the government plan to develop more green workforce while at the same time keep our existing forest cover intact if not increase them as they have been proven to provide for the resilience of rural communities. So soalan dia basically macam ni. Uh, sangat bergembira dan sangat setuju dengan uh, uh, minister yang amat bahagia Datuk Patinggi Dr. Abang. Fokus dia ialah kita nak pergi go green tapi pada masa sama juga ialah macam mana nak protect juga uh, kita punya forest ni, kita punya uh, hutan ni pada masa sama juga. Thank Itu you. I think this is, thank you. This is a very interesting question. You know what happened was uh, before there is a policy of uh, afforestation meaning replanting exercise and then uh, we were expecting uh, people who are involved in timber uh, industry to help replant the trees but apparently there is a certain weakness there some are willing to plant some are not willing to plant so I have requested the people in that sector to look into how we want to really aggressively uh, plan uh, reforestation, meaning we replant uh, our trees. So I have a new idea, but then I leave to them to deliberate and recommend what is the best method. You know, I think we must have a very aggressive and consistent policy of replanting our forest. For instance, our swamp area, we can plant new species of trees and we have done it in Sungai Salak. Apparently, within three years, four years, the trees are quite big. So in other words, there is no serious effort uh, on the part of the private sector where we want them to plant apparently not very successful so we have to have a relook in this policy so that uh, we can uh, sort of enrich uh, our forests that have been worked out and this the government has to invest because it is a state asset uh, to me uh, whatever revenue that we have we have to reinvest uh, our uh, our fund to do reforestation and this is very important for our future, not only for environment to produce oxygen, but also a very consistent and well-planned forestry policy as a raw material for uh, the end product of our forest. Uh, very interesting uh, uh, question, but I leave it to the members of the Economic Action Committee Council to look into that possibility. Thank you, Yamak Bomat, uh, Datuk Patinggi. I, I, I have a list of questions uh, my SO just handed over to me, sir. But I, I'm not going to read all of them. There's just too many. I will just uh, probably uh, pick up a few. Now, uh, this is from uh, Kennedy Deng uh, Belarik. Uh. Uh, he's saying, good morning, uh, Datuk Patinggi. Is there a special relief fund for Sarawak SMEs? Commercial banks are not approving all applications for SRF. Any special funds with easier approval for Sarawakian business owners? Yes, uh, as you know, uh, yes, this uh, special relief uh, fund is the fund uh, processed uh, by Bank Nagara. They are given allocation, I think, about five billion. And we have uh, agreed, uh, and Ben Nagara has agreed to allocate one billion to Sarawak. So, in other words, uh, the fund is only restricted to one billion and dispersed by the bank, the commercial bank. What Sarawak is doing is this: with that one billion, Sarawak will absorb the interest 
in other words, interest free uh, for three and a half years. Uh, the SMEs who got the, the, the fund, the loan from the commercial bank, they don't have to pay interest. The Sarawak government will pay interest. In other words, if you want to talk about the volume uh, that is being uh, granted by Ben Negara to this uh, special fund, relief fund, Sarawak only got one billion. Unless there is uh, additional uh, what call uh, volume, additional fund, then we can expand it. Uh, but for Sarawak to give out the fund, we have to talk to Ben Negara. Thank you, Yaba Omar, uh, uh, Datuk Patinggi, for responding. Another question, this is uh, very straightforward. Uh, it is from Deborah Dries. Huh? How you, uh, uh, Yaba Omar, you, you mentioned about the 10 sectors, you know, which uh, the government of Sarawak is now giving uh, focus on. And she is asking, how can the rakyat participate in contributing to these 10 sectors that you mentioned? How can they come on board, you know? I think they would, like, they would like to be part, you know, of this initiative. How can they participate? Yeah. Thank you very much for the response. At the moment, let the council uh, and the sub uh, members of the committee to deliberate and let them recommend. I can't respond at the moment because it is basically based on their recommendation. Inside the committee, we have experienced people and economists as well as academics plus uh, the private sector. I would like them to deliberate first uh, and see their recommendation because this is uh, multi-dimensional views from the private sector, public sector, as well as uh, the professional, including academics. And we have to look into and study their proposal. And then from then on, then we have uh, policy by itself for us to implement for the next uh, up to the year 2030. This is very important because it must be an inclusive policy, not only the government itself. Government must get the feedback and views from the public. And that will be a policy that is very inclusive for the future of our state. Right. Dr. Patinggi, banyak soalan ni lah Datuk Patinggi. Saya ingat setengah tu mungkin uh, we will just get in the posted to your office, get your officers to respond. <laughs> yeah, maybe there's one, question, yeah, there's one question here, I think which is uh, pertinent to our discussion. Uh. Uh, this is coming from uh, Lucas Drews. Uh. Uh, he mentioned about, uh, yes, there is a need for, you know, uh, good connectivity if we want to embark, you know, on full digitalization, you know, initiative, uh, going towards digital economy. Now, uh, he would like to know, uh, uh, you know, what, what is the uh, action now being taken by the Sarawak government uh, to address the internet inequalities? Uh, you mentioned, you know, Sarawak is a big state uh, between the urban and rural area because uh, there is a need for increase, you know, uh, connectivity so that, you know, the rakyat in Sarawak can have access and they can be part of the whole uh, digital economy, uh, you know, uh, program. Yeah, I think uh, our digital program started only about two years ago when uh, we set up SMA and we have given them on the state side uh, allocation fund about one billion ringgit and it takes time for us to set up our towers and also fiber optic and this is uh, very important. It's in, in the process now. It takes time. I know it takes time. Uh, if we were to use satellite, it's very costly. But we are looking into the various technology uh, that is available in order to accelerate the connectivity aspect. Uh, as you know, <laughs> during the COVID-19, even uh, education has transformed. You can see people are learning through Zoom. And Zoom is a new software uh, there's a combination of Skype. Originally, it was Skype, but they improved it uh, to produce this new software. I understand the inventor is very young. and it, This is being used in our education. The other day, I was with one student, and uh, he was interacting with his colleague, three, six students, and one teacher. 
And this is what is being done now. In other words, what I'm saying is the infrastructure, I hope, but the year 2023 or 25 are all covered between the north to southern part of Sarawak, hopefully. And this will definitely transform the connectivity landscape in Sarawak. It is a tough job, but uh, I hope we can uh, definitely reach our target. At the moment, yes, there are a lot of black spots because there are towers are not available there. Uh, we are now doing it uh, at the moment. Thank you, Yama Oma, for responding uh, to uh, you know some of the questions here. I think uh, the rest, I think, sir, we will get it posted to your office. Yeah. <laughs> there are just okay. so many, and, and I know uh, a lot more are coming. Now, yeah. sir, I think we have, uh, I think, uh, uh, reached, I think, to the end of the session. And uh, 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 if I may, uh, you know, uh, thank you again, sir, for your frank uh, uh, you. responses and so down to earth explanation. You have been very clear with your explanation. I hope your responses uh, has actually helped, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, inspire uh, many people, uh, including all sectors uh, in the state of Sarawak who are with us uh, uh, during this, you know, webinar session. Uh. Now, we believe in one thing, sir, while we are under these uh, difficult challenges, not just, you know, Sarawak, not just Malaysia, I think the whole world is under, uh, you know, the uh, challenges that we are all facing, but we need to stay positive and we take it, you know, as an opportunity to be even more productive. Now, the tagline that we have been proposing, yeah, uh, stay safe, uh, stay healthy, but we can still, you know, stay productive. Now, uh, this is where the importance of really leveraging on uh, digital technology. You can be where you are, you can be at home, you can be working away from office, but you can still be productive. So thank you again, sir, you know, for, you know, uh, you know uh, spending your time and also responding to many of the questions. You have also shared your thoughts in many of the issues that were raised, questions that were also, you know, posed to you. Now, uh, I would like to take this opportunity, sir, uh, since uh, we have what we call uh, the launching of the Sarawak Productive. Now, I would like to call upon, you know, your good self, you know, probably to deliver uh, your kind remarks and to officially launch uh, the program, what we call Sarawak Productive. Uh, over to you, Yamak uh, Borma, please. Thank you very much. Uh, to the people out there, I would like to express my appreciation for participating in this uh, webinar. You know, last time there wasn't any word called webinar. We have seminar, but pandemic uh, has created a new term called webinar and then uh, i would like uh, you know to uh, take this opportunity to launch what we call sarawak productive it is a series of webinars to create awareness about digital transformation for small and medium enterprises especially in the subsector of retail as well as uh, F and B, and this is very important in the services sector, including uh, tourism. This webinar will assist businesses to operate on digital platform, as well as to promote business matching between uh, digital service providers and entrepreneurs. This uh, excellent transformation journey. For us, is a holistic uh, approach for organization intending to move their performance to the next level that is threatening engagement and creating a greater value to stakeholders as well as thriving in the competitive marketplace. As I mentioned earlier, the Enterprise Innovation Intervention Program that is EIIP is also a program that improves productivity and quality of the enterprise level. This program assists enterprise through hands-on approach and provides intervention in existing practices to help solve productivity and quality issues. 
uh, to further assist businesses, the business virtual advisory services will be launched in August 2020. And this virtual advisory services comprises of business webinar, business virtual advisory clinic, business virtual mentoring, business virtual coordination, and uh, virtual training with an objective to bring productivity activities to every businesses that connects to the internet. Besides that, initiative by the Good Regulatory Practices, GRP, by MPC on the regulatory administration reform will further support the country's aspiration towards becoming a high income and a progressive nation. With that, uh, I would like uh, with great pleasure to officiate the launch of this Rawa Productive. Thank you. Mentoring eh? with the business community. I think we good. Thank you, Yang Mbak Berhormat, uh, for officially uh, you know launching the uh, Sarawak Productive. And I would like to congratulate also uh, everyone in Sarawak eh? uh, because the various programs which have been outlined. Uh, you know, to be implemented with this uh, program, uh, Sarawak Productive. We hope that, you know, it will assist, you know, uh, all organizations, also industries to bring them to higher level in terms of productivity improvement. So once again, sir, we would like to thank you uh, and also all participants who have participated, you know, in our program, uh, post-COVID-19, uh, Sarawak, the new normal, an honor to serve you, sir, and also the state of Sarawak, Sayangku Sarawak, and say I'm productive. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and say stay productive. For the participants before you pen off, please fill up the uh, evaluation form because this will help us, you know, to improve further our future, uh, you know, services that we provide to you. So thank you again, sir. On behalf of MPC, we would like to thank you and the Chief Minister of Sarawak and also everyone in Sarawak, the civil service leaders in Sarawak and also the industries. We look forward, you know, to a stronger and closer collaboration between the state of Sarawak and also us in MPC. Thank you again, sir. Have a good day. We'll see you again. Take care. Thank Stay you. Safe. Thank, Thank you, you Dato. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dato. See you lah. Nanti datang Sarawak lah. See you again. <laughs> saya akan datang. Terima kasih yang berhormat. Saya akan sampai nanti insya Allah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, terima kasih yang berbahagia Datuk Abdul Latif bin Haji Usman dan terima kasih kepada bahagian Datuk Pak Tinggi Dr. Abang Haji dan uh, terima kasih kepada bahagian dan insya-Allah kita akan berjumpa lagi untuk uh, sesi
Masih akan datang Terima kasih banyak-banyak kerana bersama uh, saya saya Jero Azrul merupakan host dan koordinator untuk webinar dan bekerjasama dengan MPC uh, Sarawak. Terima kasih banyak-banyak kepada Hajar Sarimah dan tim Fadli dan juga Fiza dan terima kasih banyak-banyak kepada <coughs> iaitu daripada HQ MPC dan terima kasih kepada semua. Saya dapati kita rekod iaitu kita menghampiri sebenarnya untuk live pagi ini secara real time iaitu lebih kurang dalam 1500 dan saya tadi tengok sampai 1700. Tahniah pada semua, tahniah. Kita sedang live stream di FB di Sarawakku dan kita juga sedang di dalam uh, page. Maksudnya pada masa sama juga, pada yang webinar tu semua soalan ni memang kita ada kumpul. Terima kasih banyak. Tolong jawab evaluation form dan insyaAllah kita akan juga remind pada you. Terima kasih banyak-banyak. Jumpa lagi dan salam hormat. All the best dan Assalamualaikum. Dan semoga kita jumpa untuk next sesi di mana webinar-webinar yang lebih uh, praktikal dan juga lebih realistik untuk kita bawa kepada anda. Okay, jumpa lagi dan salam hormat. Terima kasih daripada saya.